This week I was going to make an update to the convention circuit dramas involving Gamergate, with the only very recent expulsion of Ralph from Brianna Wu's Gamergate panel and the Tokyo Expo's invitation to the Honey Badgers, an express barring of anyone connected with the Calgary Expo, there is certainly a lot to talk about. However, two videos in the row on the same subject can be rather much, and honestly, I'm probably not the best person to cover these subjects in detail. So what I'm going to try and do is try something completely different and talk about a meta-subject specifically the subject of bias, namely the subject of interjections of a creator's worldview into their material. Some might say this is innate to any creative venue. However, things become a bit more sticky when certain worldviews come into play, like sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, and homophobia. Yet, just like with any modern day political bend, there is an art in which the creator can even use these traits to craft wonderful narratives and stories. And it all depends on the meta-narrative. To put this in context, Alan Moore's upcoming Providence, a comic series based on H.P. Lovecraft's lore, has a gay Jewish protagonist. At first, this will seem like tokenism all over again. After all, characters in theory are best when developed as individuals rather than representations or members of a demographic. To understand why this isn't exactly the case this time requires a bit of context. H.P. Lovecraft was well known as a homophobe and anti-Semite, attributes in his time which may or may not have been accepted readily. The idea that Providence's Robert Black would have these attributes then become a way to test the philosophy behind Lovecraft's narrative, to the point of also having Black embody the character of the outsider, which Moore notes was a common trope in Lovecraft's stories and one possibly which was meant to embody Lovecraft himself. This idea is neither here nor there for me. As talented as Moore is, I'm sure he can pull off such a move without seeming preachy or as blatant as other comics these days like Femfor. Where I'd expressly disagree with Moore, and with any other opponent of Lovecraft's stances, is this idea that somehow, by being this way, somehow H.P. Lovecraft damages his own stories, when in reality it shows just how masterfully Lovecraft was able to use his own worldview to create some of the most effective horror. Moore notes in his interview with BleedingCool.com that I'm sure Lovecraft felt like an outsider, but if you actually look at his attitudes, they are actually precisely those of the white, middle-class, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, heterosexual men of his period. All of his fears were almost exactly the median of social fears at the time. He was frightened of Bolsheviks, he was frightened of foreigners, he was frightened of women, he was frightened of gay people. This view is one that I'd have to do more research into, frankly, before affirming it onto Lovecraft's character. In fact, it's a statement that I do not feel comfortable ascribing to the general worldview of 20th century white cis men, and really, in making the extension, more puts himself into absurdist territory. The idea, however, that Lovecraft far more than hated but feared certain demographics adds depth to his material as a horror writer known for creating a world where men are threatened by the fearful monsters lurking in the background waiting to destroy humanity. Presuming then that Lovecraft held this stance, one reason Lovecraft was so successful in his world building easily could have stemmed from this fear he had and was something he could directly translate onto the page. In fact, this idea that creators use their own worldview in their creations is ubiquitous to the world of literature. Authors such as Roald Dahl based Oompa Loompas on his racist stereotype of Africans that very much reflected his own racist views on black people, making Wonka's Chocolate Factory far more twisted, by the way. L. Frank Baum's political drive concerning the gold standard created much of the imagery we recognize as Oz today. 
Yet, not all of these works are, in a more subjective standpoint, exemplary. Jane Austen's commentary on social class, for example, strikes me far more effective than anything Charles Dickens ever wrote on the subject. In fact, the rich tradition of creating stories with personal bends continues on today in the form of often weak tropes that I don't see many people liking, such as tokenism, one-trait character development, and you get the idea. As it turns out, good literature doesn't rely on bias alone. Just as a good story doesn't dump down concepts, good storytellers create deep meaning underneath their base narrative that makes the media worth consuming. After all, Lovecraft is still a scary world full of monsters, C.S. Lewis's Narnia is still vastly different from our own, and even in non-fiction, writers like Jane Austen's plots remain far more complex than the social circumstances that go on in the society around them. Instead of pushing their ideas to the front ground, the situations and narratives create a natural playground which allows the ideas expressed to organically interact with the audience consuming whatever piece of work it is. This is similarly what draws me to a game such as Gone Home over the similar classified game Depression Quest. While neither are certainly great masterpieces, Gone Home's storyline was actually passable as not only a gay story but as a love story with characters that had some depth and even some side conflicts, such as the parents who had a rocky divorce, that are left very much up to the player to discover. It was certainly far more entertaining than Depression Quest Simpleton's view of depression, which was flatly stated to the viewer in the most unappetizing way possible. Before the X-Men became a vehicle for Hugh Jackman to show off his muscles, it was a gripping series that explored ideas of the social outcasts, the attitudes they formed, how they interacted with fellow outcasts and those within the outside community, all without having to mention real-life problems such as attitudes towards gay people, minorities, or those kinds of things that are too often overplayed nowadays. The act of discovering just how deep a meta narrative goes made these works all the more worth it. And those who would understate Lovecraft's stories for something as stupid as his social views does a great disservice to horror and to the world of literature itself. The world of social justice will have you believe the only good stories out there are the ones free from any form of nastiness. No triggering images, no uncomfortable themes, nothing that challenges an individual's ideas. Yet, what they miss in characterizing masters of their respective art forms like Lovecraft as bigots not worth reading is the value that, done well, a creator's worldview can have a great effect on their final product. Their own attempts even become no more than awkward forced moments because, in the end, that is all these people will ever have points and agendas without anything else interesting to frame them with. Maybe this is why they can't stand geeks and their hobbies. This has been Robert Stoll of the Stoll Review, and if you like this content, please like, favorite, and subscribe. May all of you have a good weekend.